Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And among the various deities we can come across during the events of Skyrim, or heck, any Elder Scrolls game for that matter, Shia Gorath stands out as an especially unique god. Daedric Lord of Madness, this extremely powerful character is defined by his unpredictability, extroverted nature, and awkward goofiness. While most divines take themselves very seriously, our boy Shia Gorath can literally laugh at anything himself especially, and when he does intervene in mortal affairs, it's usually just for a chuckle. This trademark personality has turned the Jester God into one of the franchise's most beloved characters. But, as one-dimensional as he may seem, this Prince of Insanity is a very complex character, with far more on his mind than just cheese and fishy sticks. And there's much about him that even veterans of this series likely never imagined. So today we'll be embracing the crazy, as we dive right into five things you, probably, never knew about Shia Gorath. Starting off, in Skyrim, Shia Gorath has a rather minor role. He's only featured in a single quest called The Mind of Madness, and the mission, while enjoyable, is pretty short. In it, we're sent by a supposed worshipper of Shio's to go find the god in a strange, supernatural realm that he calls the Mind of Madness, and convince him to leave. After we arrive, the prince will happily and enthusiastically greet us, but refuse to exit until we complete three trials for him, themed around paranoia, anger, and nightmares. Once the trials have been completed, our host will finally agree, and decide it's time to pack up and head out, completing the quest. That's it. Shouldn't take more than 20 minutes, if that. However, an analysis of Skyrim's game files and some assets left behind by Bethesda suggest that this adventure was originally planned to be much, much larger in scale and scope, and it may have even allowed us to visit multiple other new locations. However, for whatever reason, the devs ultimately ended up scrapping most of their ideas and trimming the quest down to what it is today. There's an unused world space in Skyrim that we can actually teleport to with console commands, called Old Blue Palace Wing 01. It's a large dungeon that appears to be in some non-mortal dimension. The space is pretty big and has all sorts of unique quirks. Like, the level is designed to feature two separate castles divided by an exterior courtyard. However, both of the castles are structurally identical to one another. They're like copies. The only difference being that one of the castles is really clean and nice, and the other is a big mess. Furthermore, we can find this really cool but clearly unfinished card matching memory game, where we'd have to flip over cards and then match them with an unflipped over card before it was shuffled. It's incredibly neat, and kind of reminds me of Rummy if you know what I'm talking about. Oh, and this is really odd, during the vanilla version of Shiagorath's quest that we do play, if the Dragonborn uses console commands to noclip beyond the playable borders of the realm we're in, and if you head east, you'll eventually find a random door. Just sitting around in the middle of nowhere that shouldn't even be accessible. Open it up, and it leads to an entire another world space that too is also obviously unfinished. This one appears to place the player in a small house that's on top of a giant ancient Nord table, inside of a giant ancient Nord ruin, almost giving us the illusion that we've been shrunken down in our miniature. Unfortunately, while these unused locations are present in the game, and there are a few quest markers visible in the creation kit, everything is so incomplete, we can't really put together what Bethesda's exact plan was. Maybe these areas were going to be extra places we'd travel to during Chio's quest, or maybe they were the original setting of the entire mission before BGS scrapped them and redid everything. Whatever the studio was thinking, only Todd Howard knows, and Todd Howard won't tell. Next on our list, let's talk about the Elder Scrolls' mobile game, Blades, which is totally not controversial and is beloved by everyone. Released in 2019, the game is set about 20 years prior to the events of Skyrim, shortly after the Empire's defeat to the Ultimary Dominion in the Great War. And in it, you play as a former member of a faction called the Blades, who's been hunted by the Thalmor. 
Frankly, I love the setting, but I don't bring this game up much in my videos, largely because A, I never really got into it, and B, despite being placed in a very cool setting, the story is so short, there's not a whole lot of neat lore contributions it makes. Though, there are a few, that I still need to find the right opportunities to discuss. Anyway, the reason I'm talking about Blades now is because many fans, myself included, believe that in the game, we can meet Shiagorath in disguise, and he might have some weird plans. You see, a big concept the mobile game emphasizes is allowing players to create their own town, and early in the game, a man named Theodore Gorlash will show up at our player town. He has the ability to magically change our appearance, and also introduces the player to a mysterious non-mortal realm called the Abyss. The Abyss is a giant, never-ending dungeon, located somewhere in Oblivion, that can be used for farming. Anyway, many a Blade suspect this Theodore Gorlash fellow is actually Shia Gorath, just disguising himself as a helpful mortal. Sadly, the character is unvoiced, so we can't use that for a frame of reference, but his appearance is very, very similar to that of the Mad Gods, especially with those piercing yellow eyes. On top of that, he has an incredibly deep knowledge of various magical concepts that a person shouldn't know about, and his speaking style very much matches Shio's own. Oh, and here's the final kicker, the letters of Theodore Gorlash's name can be rearranged to instead spell out Lord Shiagorath. So, there you go. This is definitely him. Probably. Now, funnily enough, Theodore is presented by the game as merely a helpful, slightly crazy citizen. And beyond helping us access the Abyss and changing our facial appearance if we ask, we have absolutely no interactions with the character, or any other info. This is concerning, because when Shiagorath does intervene in the affairs of mortals, he is never doing it just to be a nice guy. There's always a hidden agenda. Sometimes he's only trying to drive random people crazy for his own amusement, or sometimes he uses mortals as pawns in larger games he's playing with other gods. So, if that was Shio helping us, what the heck was he planning? Why? Blades' storyline has next to nothing to do with Daedra or anything like that. It's all about town building and hiding from the Thalmor, things Shiagorath doesn't have a stake in. I don't know, maybe in a future Elder Scrolls game or even some sort of Blades content add-on, we'll get more information on why our character somehow attracted the interest of the strange deity. But I'm willing to bet, whatever his motivations, we probably won't like them. Coming in at number three, there's no way I could do one of these videos about the Mad God without mentioning the fact that when we meet him in Skyrim, he's actually the player character from Oblivion. Yeah, your character in the last Tez game became Shio. Let me explain. So, while as mentioned, this Daedra occupies a relatively minor role in The Elder Scrolls V, he did have a very big role in The Elder Scrolls IV specifically in its second expansion pack, The Shivering Isles, which took place in Shiagorath's Plane of Oblivion, called the Shivering Isles. While here, we learn that Shiagorath is at odds with another Daedric god, named Jigalag, who's basically his exact opposite. While Shiagorath's sphere consists of insanity, madness, and unpredictability, Jigalag's sphere is sanity, logic, order, and reason, you can see why these two heads clash frequently. The DLC takes place as Jigalag is launching an all-out invasion of Shiagorath's Oblivion Realm. Jigalag's trying to conquer the Shivering Isles. The way we stop him is by mantling Shiagorath. Mantling, for those of you who don't know, is a really odd concept in the Elder Scrolls' lore where a person or being is able to transform into or assume the identity of another. Basically, during the events of this DLC, we have to mantle or become Shiagorath in order to save his realm. And that's exactly what happens. Our transformation is ultimately completed when we finally defeat Jigalag personally. And after we do so, the Daedric God of Logic, Order, and Reason 
even confirms to the player that, yeah, you are the new Shiagorath now. Good luck. And that's how the Shivering Isles DLC ends. So, unless someone else mantled and became Shio in between that DLC and The Elder Scrolls V, the Shiagorath we meet in Skyrim is definitely our character from Oblivion. Now, real quick, I must admit that I merely provided the spark notes on what's happening in the Shivering Isles' DLC. There's a lot more going on between Shio and Jigalag that I'm not able to break down right now. It's just such a complex affair with so many moving parts, it would require an entire video. The whole Grey March and the fact that Shiagorath is actually technically kind of Jigalag, like they're the same, and it's really weird. You get the point, though. Shiagorath in Skyrim is really a more familiar face than we might have thought. For Fort Spot, let's head on back to Skyrim. Specifically, to Riften's Royal Court, where it's believed that Shiagorath may secretly have a very important person under his influence. Wylandria is the Bosmer Court Wizard, who manages all things magical and alchemical for the Jarl. Normally folks in this position, Court Wizard, are very smart, serious, and focused individuals. However, this one is, well, a little different. She's very scatterbrained. Speak to her, and Wylandria will spout all sorts of crazy, as well as constantly fail to keep the conversation on a given topic. Take a listen. Genius! And I'm sure you've completely worked out how to counteract complete dimensional collapse, right? Are you completely insane? Swallow a soul gem? That has to be the most brilliant and unexpected solution I've heard in a long time. It solves all of my problems and keeps the field stable. Now all I need... Wait... What were we talking about? Now, normally, one could write this off as Bethesda just having a little fun, and creating a really unique personality. But, there's likely more to it than that. Her quirkiness seems to have some association with the Mad God himself. Take a listen to this dialogue possibility, where she goes off about calipers. ...its own field. Calipers? That's utterly ridiculous. Maybe long ago you could just find calipers in every household across Tamriel, but not anymore. Hold on. You've given me a brilliant idea. Just as calipers hold materials in place, a soul siphon can hold magic fields in place. Genius! Calipers, for those of you who don't know, were miscellaneous utensil-like item featured in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. They sort of became a meme after they made a prominent appearance in the Shivering Isles quest, Work Is Never Done, that required you to collect, like, a hundred of the item. Calipers were never brought back when Skyrim released, and as a result, people have been talking about them all the time, and Lord Shio even mentions their disappearance very briefly in his own mission. So, right there, we can already identify a slim connection between Mylandria and Shiagorath. However, even more eyebrow-raising is the fact that beneath Wylandria's desk, players can uncover a note titled, Per Your Requests. Apparently, this letter was written by higher-ups at the College of Winterhold, who were responding to a series of requests Wylandria made for various items. In the letter, the College is confused about one specific ingredient requested, called Green Moat, stating they have no idea what Green Moat is, and question if maybe she meant to spell something else but didn't get it right? Well, Green Moat is a powerful psychotic consumable that can only be found in the Shivering Isles, Shiagorath's home, and its existence is supposed to be unknown to mortals. The only way why Landry could have any idea of it is if she journeyed to oblivion herself, or spoke at length with someone who did. Could this studious Bosmer be a true follower of the Lord of Insanity himself. A worshipper or associate, perhaps. Or maybe this is all just a simple Easter egg by Bethesda with little more thought. Whatever the case, I guess we'll have to decide for ourselves. And finally, last on our list, the god of all things insanity may have invented music. At least, according to some of his followers. So, there's a book we can find in Skyrim, which actually first appeared in the Shivering Isles DLC, 
called Myths of Sheagorath, which serves as a collection of various stories about the god, and adventures he possibly participated in, such as a time in which he outsmarted a king or tricked a great wizard. Well, one of these stories alleges he was the first entity to create instruments. It's a short tale, so I'll just read it directly. Quote, in the earliest of days, in a time when the world was still raw, Sheagorath decided to walk amongst the mortals. He donned his guise of a gentleman with a cane, and moved from place to place without being recognized. After eleven days and eleven nights, Sheagorath decided that life among mortals was even more boring than his otherworldly existence. What can I do to make their lives more interesting, he said to himself. At that same moment, a young woman nearby commented wistfully to herself, The sounds of birds are so beautiful. Sheagorath silently agreed with her. Mortals could not make the beautiful and inspired calls of birds. Their voices were wretched and mundane. He could not change the nature of mortals, for that was the purview of other Daedric princes. However, he could give them the tools to make beautiful sounds. Sheagorath took hold of the petulant woman and ripped her asunder. From her tendons, he made lutes. From her skull and arm bones, he made a drum. From her bones, he made flutes. He presented these gifts to the mortals, and thus, music was born. So, there you have it. The subject of today's video is not only the god of mental instability, but apparently also the founder of the musical arts. Or, well, more specifically, I think the story suggests he invented instruments rather than music, but I'm not going to be too nitpicky. Oddly, in the Elder Scrolls universe, there aren't any other gods, neither Daedric nor Adric, that have music as a part of their sphere of influence. And after digging around for quite a while, I wasn't able to find any contradicting stories. No other tales of the invention of instruments appear to exist in the lore. So, while this story is presented as a myth, and clearly has the potential to not be true, it's all we have right now. I guess we owe more to Shio than we realize. And with that, we are going to wrap up. Five things you probably never knew about Shiagorath of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Thanks so much for stopping by, everybody. Which of these tiny details or Easter eggs did you find to be the most fascinating? And what Shiagorath related information did we miss out on today? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.